have among us also Helen. Uh, Helen is the president and CEO of Climate Works Foundation. She brings over 25 years of uh, global experience at the intersection of environmental action, economic development, and climate change uh, policy on her robe. And we have uh, Jinjin Gao, uh, who is an adaptation uh, scientist at UNEP Copenhagen Climate Change Center, where her research is in the field of climate uh, risk assessment, adaptation, transparency, and resilience building, among others. And uh, so we, we have, um, just to, to be sure that I have all the speakers, um, I think uh, w my notes here are mixed up. So I think we'll like to invite you as well. Uh, it's um, Fernando. Yeah, Fernando. And uh, Fernando, if we can just briefly tell us your work so that I <laughs> misrepresent that you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fernando Castellanos. I'm with the UN Global Compact uh, Business Led Initiative in the United Nations. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando. And uh, we have Sh Shingi, uh, who is also a, a research group leader at the CSIR, and his work involves aspects of climate change. Welcome to the uh, to the to the floor. Thanks. So now we'll go through the the the, the opening uh, statement for our panelists, and uh, I think it it makes sense that we should have uh, Mire starting uh, to give the first opening remarks. Thanks. Please uh, uh, over to the to the podium. Thanks. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. I haven't had coffee either, um, but I'm not sure that I'm going to be as brilliant as my uh, predecessor. I've been asked uh, to focus my, foc uh, my opening remarks on whether or not, uh, on, on how can the global stock take facilitate the regional green growth agenda through adaptation um, uh, implementation and resilience building. And here I have to say that the GST report, which will be released in a couple of days, is actually uh, a very critical report. As you have mentioned, it's one of the very few reports that brings together all the different sides of, uh, of climate. So one of the opportunities is that it no longer actually m puts in contradiction adaptation and mitigation. Coming from UNEP, we are the agency that produces the adaptation gap report, the emission gap report, the state of finance for nature report. And in fact, the global stock take is a really very interesting exercise, as you said. It enables us to see opportunities that are both, um, that have both uh, uh, um, advantages for adaptation and mitigation. I'm thinking about, in particular, in the continent, in the African continent, we have a trend towards um, megapoles, megacities, urbanization, uh, the whole issue of cooling, of designing urban environments in such a way that they reduce, b reduce both uh, their greenhouse gas footprint, but also are uh, ably and adequately adapted to the future of climate is something that is a huge opportunity that can generate also one of the challenges from the adaptation and resilience point of view is that oftentimes it is not perceived as a bankable, financially interesting pro uh, investments. In, in, in general, we see that what is bankable is more on the side of renewable energies, energy efficiency, everything that brings investment and has a return on investment. Whereas on the adaptation side, it's usually touted as this is where you will have economic impacts on the long term. So if you invest today, you will reduce those impacts on the long term. That's not how businesses are run today, or that's not how the financial rationale is run today. And so the GST actually give, gives us this opportunity to think about those dual dividends um, on both uh, sides of adaptation mitigation, makes adaptation, has the potential of making adaptation 
much more interesting for investment, for private sector to start footing the bill. The Standing Committee on Finance, all reports on the gap in finance have already told us that we already we rely very heavily on public finance as opposed to private finance for adaptation. How can we bridge that gap? Because this is truly where the real money is. And so the GST actually provides this fantastic opportunity. And as was said earlier, um, uh, the GST has innovated in its approach in that, first of all, it's taken these different regional approaches that are building up towards the global report. And second of all is that it started to acknowledge state, non-state actors' interest and uh, perspectives. And so that also uh, creates a very enriching, uh, enriching report, an innovative report. Uh, so maybe, maybe lastly, um, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that we have been for the longest time communicating around climate change um, as a risk. Now maybe it's uh, with the GST there's an opportunity to start communicating about climate change as an opportunity. Uh, first and foremost it's an opportunity to start changing the system. The system records uh, whether it's in domestic uh, um, accounting systems, whether it's at the global level with the multilateral development banks. Metrics are usually very much uh, focused on growth, very much focused on return on investment, very much focused on job creation and employment. However, everything that is related to the degradation of the natural capital of natural capital is not accounted. Risks, climate impacts are considered as, or natural hazards, are coming out from the, um, from the emergency relief uh, budget of governments. And so maybe now with the GST is also an opportunity to start shifting that narrative into integrating those climate risks as opportunities and looking on the, and, and shifting the, the way that we measure our success towards a more longer term one than a shorter term one. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. She says we should start thinking of uh, risk as an opportunity. Thank you very much for those uh, remarks, uh, Mary. Uh, next, we'll have Helen. Uh, welcome to the floor. Thank you very much, and it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. Um, at Climate Works Foundation, we're really an organization that helps philanthropy to build strategies and deliver funding to support climate action around the world, working in more than 50 countries. We've been really honored to be able to host and support um, the independent global stock take uh, process over the last few years, which is a consortium of over 20 organizations around the world in regional hubs, including the West Africa one, which Waskell has been leading, uh, working with many of you here. Um, and it's a group of climate researchers, advocates, um, and others coming together to really look at how to strengthen, ensure a strong global stock take this year, and then also how to carry that forward into implementation. How do we translate that into the work that needs to happen in countries on the ground in terms of mitigation, adaptation, finance, and addressing uh, loss and damage? How to get truly transformative climate action? As we're seeing climate impacts uh, spread around the world intensify and with the most vulnerable hit the hardest, we're really at a truly critical moment in the climate fight. And the global stock take this year, as Brian and others have said, the global stock take is such an important moment. It's the first ever, it uh, can be the biggest accountability mechanism on climate action. How are we actually doing? How far are we off track? Where do we need to close those gaps? really shining that spotlight on this. But it can also be a global accelerator, as Brian said, the ambition mechanism. How do we actually enhance ambition across all the different areas, adaptation, mitigation, finance? How do we enhance that ambition using the global stock take now in a way that leaves no one behind? The technical phase of the global stock takes about to conclude. We'll be getting the report in a few days now. Um, and now the focus must shift to the political outcome, which will come out of COP28 in December. How can we ensure that from the technical work, the work that's been done in the regions and all of the groups, 
that's feeding into the technical report, how do we ensure that lands in some key mes messages in the country agreed political outcome, which can really help countries and non-state actors to implement ambition going forward? That's going to be a really critical, um, critical point here. So we've got about four months to help land some of those key messages um, in the political outcome. And I just wanted to highlight uh, five of the key messages we think are gonna be important to land there to help guide countries going forward with the kind of ambition we need. One is just to really ensure that countries are committed to enhancing their ambition on mitigation through their, their, through their NDCs as they submit those again leading up to COP30 in Brazil. So how do we use the global stock takes results to do that? How do we use it to help en enhance ambition in the national adaptation plans as well? How do we use them to do that? That's first. Second, we will need a commitment to rapidly and equitably um, scale up renewable energy significantly and phase out fossil fuels. Third, it's we do need commitments to really foster sustainable and resilient food systems and agriculture while halting and reversing deforestation, degradation, and biodiversity loss. This is an area that's been neglected far too much in the climate space and is absolutely essential for um, uh, food sustainability, absolutely essential for livelihoods, food security, adaptation, um, and natural ecosystems, as well as mitigation. We also need to ensure that we have specific measures built in around how to enhance adaptation capabilities and respond to losses and damages. We now have a mandate through the UNFCCC to understand and respond to losses and damages. So how do we do that, including ensuring access to finance to support these? Um, and then fifth, just across the board, we really need clear, trustworthy solutions to scaling and shifting finance, including through the MDB reforms that we need to see happen to really ensure we have a green growth path going forward. There will not be any growth unless it is green. That's not gonna be possible. And we need to ensure that we're really supporting countries and non-state actors as they step up to these challenges in the coming years and can really tackle climate. So excited to be here with you and to work together, uh, continue working together as we move towards uh, COP28 and then beyond as we implement the results of the global stock take. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. A very succinct summary and focus on how we can turn the outcomes of the global stock take into uh, outputs on the ground, leave emphasis on things that are really relevant for the civil society organizations. Uh, next, we will have um, Fernando uh, giving his uh, statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm with the UN Global Compact where we aim to mobilize businesses uh, around 10 principles, including on, on environment. Um, so I like to think of, uh, of the Global Compact. Uh, we're not uh, um, ad uh, advocating for businesses, but we're advocating for the UN uh, with businesses and trying to move them um, towards climate action, among other uh, issues. Um, and we know in, in the context of the GST, um, sort of the process in um, in the context of assessing where we are towards the 1.5 degree goal and, and uh, or the two degree goals of the Paris Agreement, we know the outcome of, of that assessment. Uh, we know that more ambition and more action is needed. Um, and, and these are words that have been around for over a decade, um, but an important aspect as, as it has been uh, noted before, it's the forward looking aspect of the um, GST that it's really relevant and really important. Um, and it, it, as we look forward beyond the global stock take um, this year, or the first global stock take, is how do we translate the NDCs, the NAVs, into policies and regulations that will help uh, create enabling environments for businesses to put the money, put the investments, dedicate research, and, and have 
both innovation and in investments that will help both mitigation and adaptation. And businesses you know, in, in the region, in, in all of Africa and West Africa, they need a, a predictable and long-term policy environment uh, that will help them in all of the stages in their climate journey. And they need to understand what that journey would entail. Um, they need to assess the climate risks, both physical and transitional risks, and then look forward how would they uh, put their money, put their investments, their capital to generate more growth, more income, um, more jobs that will help the region and be more resilient and be um, more flexible in adapting to, to the adverse effects of climate change while also addressing mitigation uh, aspects. Uh, th those, the both aspects need to be addressed by the private sector. Um, and so the, the global stock um, I think it, it, it needs to, to serve as an overarching framework that will help facilitate a coordinated multi-stakeholder um, action. Um, and, and in this respect, the, the, uh, as was mentioned, the, the innovative approach of the global stock take, where there's um, roundtables, dialogues, there, there's a, a series of um, events and, and different structures to get inputs from various stakeholders has been really valuable. And hopefully that will continue as we move to a second global stock take and, and define what that second uh, GST would mean and where we would want to be. And, and and it is now the, um, the time to define um, how we want to get there and ensure we can address um, climate change in, in the best possible way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando, for providing a very clear link that as we address uh, adaptation and uh, track our progress through the GST, also this is linked to the green growth. Um, so we are done with the statements now. And uh, I would like to highlight that there will be, uh, next we're going to move to the panel discussion. And please take notes. If you have questions, note them down because there will be an opportunity also for having comments and, and questions from the floor. Uh, thanks. Um, so we'll have Viti taking us through the, um, the panel discussions. So as, as VT is approaching, I should highlight that VT is a, is a researcher in the Indian Institution of Management, uh, uh, Amedat in, in India. Thanks, over to you, VT. Uh, so much, Mahal. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, let's quickly proceed to the panel discussion. So, um, Fitu, I'd first like to go to you. Uh, can we hear your thoughts on what do you think is the role of civil society, including the private sector, of course, in terms of the local, national, regional adaptation, resilience building, based on your experience? Thank you so much. Uh, in my opinion, I think that civil society, including non-governmental organizations and uh, community-based groups, plays a critical role, you know, in building awareness, also in community engagement, empowerment, capacity, and also accountability in, you know, the national, regional, or local levels. They often, I mean, that civil society often act as advocates, but also as knowledge brokers and community organizers, but often serve as watchdogs because they are watching if uh, the adaptation strategy are well implemented you know, on the ground. And they're also watching if the national governments are doing well, you know, while accounting for their climate actions and goals. Civil society also act as 
advocate, you know, and also um, knowledge brokers, as I say. On the other hand, if you take the private sectors, you know, the, the corporates, they are playing a role of bringing financial resources, innovations, technologies on the table. And they're driving economic growth, but also contributing to adaptation strategies. Collaboration between civil society and private sector can help well address climate challenges and help nations and regions you know, to adapt themselves and also to build resilience and uh, for economic growth and also for national growth. And I think that at Waskal, where I'm working, so we understood that we need to act with, I mean, the people on the ground some, somehow. So we are trying to, I mean, design and build for end users, farmers, livestock, risers, but also other stakeholders. We are trying to develop what we call climate services, climate and environmental services for them so that they can use and try to cope with, you know, climate change, you know, impact. And uh, by doing so, uh, we were able, as you see, you know, to collaborate with CSR, but other partners to build what we call, I mean, the IGST West African Hub. Uh, we engage at the moment more than 300 civil society organizations working together on the ground, you know, to implement all those adaptation strategies and to help people advance. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Sekitu, for your remarks. Um, Mire, if I could invite you for a quick uh, intervention. You, you mentioned about uh, treating climate as an opportunity, not a risk, and you do see we need a lot more intervention for private sector. So um, I was wondering what do you think at the local, regional, and uh, you know, sort of national scale, how could that? Thank you very much. Yes, so um, I think that one of the things that the global stock take gives us is, well, unfortunately from my point of view, I consider the decision on loss and damage as a big failure because it actually demonstrates that we have failed so much on mitigation and adaptation that we're, we've gotten to the point where we admit this in a COP decision. What this also means is that, um, or what we are seeing nowadays, is that climate impacts are, what we are seeing every day on the ground is beyond what has been projected in the best downscaled and most refined models. Um, one example is, for example, Cyclone uh, Freddy that hit Mozambique and Malawi earlier uh, last year. And then it was a behavior that was not either anticipated nor ever witnessed before. So the cyclone came from the, from the Indian Ocean, hit Mozambique, went into Malawi, went back to the ocean, and then back to Malawi. This is, a, this is something that we've not, never witnessed before. And that, for me, is where lies the strength of civil society organizations and the closer to the ground we go, to the closer we go, the better the responses will be. There is flexibility, there is agility in civil society organizations and the private sector. There is also, in particular in the continent, there is also social cohesion. And uh, the social safety nets that have been replaced by um, insurance and service providers and ambulances elsewhere are actually supported by communities within the community in many parts of the world still, but particularly here in Africa. Yeah. And so there is that um, very specific role for communities, civil society organizations. On the private sector level, I, it's, it's also, I mean, adaptation is a very wild bet, right? Because 
one takes um, climate scenarios, projects oneself into the future, and says, this is my possible future, therefore, this is what I need to do. But you will only know if you did the right thing once you hit that point in the future. And as climate is unfolding nowadays, we actually don't really know what that future will be. So private sector here can play a very critical role, again, by bringing the influx of rapid response, rapid adjustment, innovation, very locally led responses that adjust, you know, like a helix, that adjust as we go, rather than having a very firm trajectory, saying this is where I want to be and being very rigid about it. So I think that that's where their advantage, the advantage of both civil society and private sector are. Thank you. So much, thank you very much. Um, uh, moving on, uh, I'd like Jing Jing to kind of share your thoughts on the GST outputs and how they could facilitate uh, private sector, civil society, adaptation resilience agenda. Um, thank you, Vedi. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is indeed a very uh, relevant question. And today, I'm wearing my hat as the co-chair of IGST Adaptation Working Group and uh, like to share a few reflections based on our IGST work in private sector's involvement uh, in GST. So as a, a key actor that need to uh, adapt to climate change, it is very important that um, the contributions and the needs um, uh, of private sector are not overlooked by the GST. Otherwise, it will limit GST's ability to fully um, inform parties and the negotiations to meet the growing demand of uh, private sector uh, in adaptation. However, at the present, so we see a very limited private uh, uh, sector's adaptation information included in uh, submission to the UFCCC. And uh, we have done some work in this area and uh, want to share a few findings. Um, so in terms of uh, adaptation reporting over the last decade, there have been a few initiatives established to document the adaptation and other climate actions implemented by uh, non-state actors, but also uh, including the private sector. Um, for example, in 2017, the publishment uh, of uh, TCFD recommendations for private sector to report, to include uh, climate ri risk related information in their corporate disclosure. Uh, another example is a global climate action portal. However, uh, due to the high level nature of those initiatives uh, and the significant differences between, uh, I mean, uh, in their uh, functions and objectives, it makes it uh, very difficult to compare and aggregate those data reported under those initiatives. And that reduces the potential uh, for those initiatives to be considered by the GST. So to facilitate uh, private sector to increase the uh, um, quality and the quantity of uh, adaptation data. So there are a few things that uh, GST output could, uh, uh, could provide support here, for example, uh, it could provide, uh, facilitate the uh, greater focus on, on climate uh, change, um, adaptation, reporting, capacity building towards private sector. So to um, understand and uh, communicate their climate risks and adaptation measures uh, uh, in their disclosure, uh, a corporate disclosure. It can also provide a technical uh, guidance uh, for national government, for example, to um, uh, guiding their domestic private sector uh, in their corporate uh, uh, disclosure in alignment with the TCFD recommendations. And uh, that helps the national government to consider, to track and assess um, those data provided by private sector and report them accordingly to the UFCCC. 
I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience on this, um, Jingjing. Uh, Helen, taking it forward from here, uh, where do you see the GST outputs uh, in terms of you know, enabling or driving civil society philanthropies towards building resilience and adaptation needs? Yeah. Thanks very much. I mean, as we said, the GST is really something which can be a roadmap for how we go forward with more ambition on climate action, adaptation, mitigation, finance. But it's a roadmap not just for countries, it's a roadmap for everyone. We know we cannot deliver the kind of transformative change in the systems we have, whether it's the food and agriculture system, energy systems, cities, urban systems, financial system. We cannot do that unless we're all a part of the solution. So we need the government commitments and the governments to come forward with funding and guidelines and regulations. But we also need very much the private sector to engage, to understand these risks and to really integrate it in what they're doing and um, how they're investing. We need civil society, often it's civil society who are closest to the ground, working with communities, understanding what the impacts are and how best to actually adjust locally to those. Local and regional governments also will pay a particularly important part in adaptation and resilience building. Um, and we need researchers, for example. I mean, there's a lot that we still do not understand and do not know. And so how can we actually understand better the impacts of a climate change, where it's coming, how it's actually accelerating, and what we can do about that, and to build some of the indicators that we need to actually track progress on delivering on adaptation and resilience in the context of implementing the GST. So we really need this whole society approach. From the philanthropic side, I think one of the things that's really um, important is normally philanthropy, it's small funding compared to what governments provide, of course, but what philanthropy is able to do is to actually move sometimes more quickly, more nimbly, uh, to come in early, take more risks, um, that what uh, than other types of financing can. So I think one of the things philanthropy can really do is help to s kick off new initiatives, start them when there's not other funding, um, to help build some of that capacity and understanding and uplift uh, some of the voices that know best on what's needed on ad adaptation and how to move forward, um, and to take on uh, take on some strategies that may work, may not, but trying different approaches. And at the moment, we have no time to waste. So we can't wait till we have the perfect answers and implement those. We need to try different approaches, move those forward. I think one of the areas that I see is really essential in it, and it builds on um, some of what uh, um, Safitu was mentioning um, and what Jingjing was mentioning, is really um, how we can build risks, understanding of risks, into the financial system. Um, and the, um, the task force, the work of the, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures was incredibly important. And we're starting to see a number of countries requiring corporates to now disclose their climate risks. And for the first time, some of them are thinking about how their operations actually enhance climate risks or are vulnerable to climate risks and starting to implement that. And if we can get the financial systems to do that and do that well, that will send signals across private sector. So that's an area that we and others in philanthropy are helping to support, getting more uh, disclosures around climate risk, more understanding, modeling, understanding of those climate risks, so the private sector and investors can really start to help shift our economy in a way that responds to these. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing those insights into how philanthropies could actually drive some of these. Uh, moving on, uh, Shingi, uh, you've, uh, we'd like to hear from you on how the regional green growth agenda uh, could benefit from the GST outputs uh, at this COP, beyond the, beyond the COP, and for GST2, et cetera. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe my point of departure will come from just to underscore what Helen has, has, has mentioned around accountability, uh, which GST can actually drive. Um, uh, and, and, and in my view, 
GST provides an impetus to amplify climate action. And uh, by nature and character, key pillars of the, 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 the regional uh, green, um, green agenda uh, revolves around mitigation to boost um, uh, a low carbon resilient economy, uh, the, the imperative to focus on adaptation, to build resilience, uh, let alone leveraging on the existing and, um, or available financial mechanisms that are there uh, to drive and propel climate action, both from mitigation and adaptation point of view, let alone the governance structure. When you look at just these pillars, and when you look at juxtapose it to, to, to what the GST uh, the imperatives actually drive, you can see a very good synergy. And hence, I want to echo the sentiments that it's actually an opportunity which we can leverage on and to drive uh, the climate actions. And uh, building a block, if you look at the character itself, the GST, it's a two-year process within every five years. And that means in terms of accountability, we can be able to actually gauge how far are we and how, what we need, what are the gaps, how can we fill that. And uh, the GST can provide that platform for us to drive that. Uh, let alone, I think the, 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 the key pivotal uh, angers which the outputs of GST can feed into the, to the agenda. In my view, they revolve around cooperative-driven uh, initiatives, the developmental trajectory and transformative uh, agenda which is needed uh, in order to propel uh, particularly the African continent. And uh, looking at the developmental imperative, uh, we can see collective progress that can be harnessed through implementation of uh, innovations in various sectors food systems, your, your, your technology uptake, diffusion and uptake, uh, let alone improved design and operation of mechanisms that are needed for particularly for the vulnerable people in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the region. The transformative di dimension uh, will hinge on the structural and system transformation that is needed let alone the equity and social justice, which are key pivotal, of which the GST and uh, its mechanism can actually try and um, propel the, 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 the needed uh, agency in making, broadening the understanding, particularly to the different sectors. Uh, let alone the need for climate justice, which is critical, uh, to broaden and bring on board the different sectors, uh, both private, public, as well as the, the, the government. And the last but not least uh, is the, 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 the agency, which I see particularly from the uh, technology transformation and localization that is needed in order to propel, which are all fruits that can be low-hanging fruits that can be protected from the, from, the, from, the, from the GST outputs are feeding to the agenda. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thanks. thanks so much. Uh, moving on to Fernando, you, you come from, you are the voice of the businesses, so where do you see the technology transitions and the G GST output pushes to, towards you know, the the regional green growth agenda. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I think um, the GST outputs um, will help us um, identify the opportunities um, where governments need to create the enabling environments to the risk and leverage uh, private sector capital and investments and make sure that these are deployed and benefiting uh, communities uh, across the world wherever businesses operate, not just uh, looking at their headquarters and, and the bottom line. And I think the GST um, as a process that also seeks to be in, uh, taking into account the inclusive and just and equitable uh, transition towards green growth, uh, it's an, an important uh, mechanism to, to have that dialogue among various stakeholders, including the private sector. I think it's important um, to know that uh, the fact that a, a, a specific company may have huge profits, that doesn't mean that they know how to address climate change. That may, 
that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to um, their risk uh, their investments in terms of climate or how do they you know what actions they need to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions it is not a, a given that uh, that there's a direct correlation between profits and uh, capacity and knowledge or, and as well willingness to address climate change. So I think uh, the GST is also as a framework for this dialogue and, and, and this push to create enabling environments and also and, um, create the accountability mechanisms to, to drive green growth uh, is uh, sort of one of those possible key outputs from the GST. Uh, how do we create growth, grow, uh, create jobs, uh, growth GDP, uh, have uh, increased incomes, but that in a way that is inclusive, just, and equitable. Um, so I, I think the, the multi-stakeholder aspect as well of, of the GST and that it is, uh, as, that is, as it has been said, not just a one-time thing. It is not just a, 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 a a thing that is to end at COP28, but uh, it's looking into the future, and it helps us a roadmap to look then towards the next uh, GST and what actions are needed uh, to be implemented, including by the private sector. It's uh, really important. Thanks so much. In the interest of time, I'd uh, ask the audience to please uh, bring in your questions. Uh, please introduce yourself before you uh, pose and also please mention who are you directing the question to on the panel. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Odero uh, from Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, uh, which is in, in the entire continent of Africa and Europe. And as, as here, I represent more than one million youths. So my question is to the whole panel. Is there a space for the youths in your organization? Because we are working with the local uh, communities, but I've not heard you mentioning that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Reina Sakari. I am the founder of uh, TWF, to Juvenile Wildlife Foundation, a newly established wildlife foundation to protect and conserve biodiversity, and also a final year student of international relations and diplomacy. So wildlife conservation and climate action can no longer be treated as isolated efforts since they are the same side, uh, since there are two sides of the same coin. So my question to the panel is, what are some of the organizations and foundations that are willing to collaborate with youth-led organizations such as TWF to conserve biodiversity in Kenya and beyond. Thank you. Uh, can we just take the responses first? I'll invite the panel to respond and then uh, there's one more. Yeah, sure. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Orlando Frederick of Anfield Properties. I basically deal with property owners in advancing uh, environmental conservation. My question is to Helen about the five points you gave us. Well, number four was about capability and loss and damage financing. Uh, my question is uh, risk is the probability of any loss occurring event, correct? We have reinsurers, we have the insurance sector. Are you looking at partnering with them to see how you can mitigate some of these risks? And how can uh, somebody like me access this kind of financing? Because you also talked about damages in finance. How can I access this? Because it's a good platform that you're having this discussion. Thank you. I'll just request one question summarizing, well, response summarizing all the questions in the interest of time. Yes. Uh, perhaps you can. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, to your question on youth, um, you know, the, the line towards adapting to climate change is not a straight line. 
it's a very windy line because we are going to be learning as we go. We're going to be facing different risks, different impacts, different realities as, as, uh, as we go. And so, well, at least in UNAP, we now have a program to support uh, youth involvement and engagement uh, more broadly on climate action, but also within UNEP um, to support a new, uh, the inclusion of the youth and, and new and fresh ideas. Because at the end of the day, when we're projecting ourselves towards climate impacts in 2050, I will probably dead, be dead, you will probably still be around here. So you need to be the decision maker today in terms of what are, what are we preparing for in the future. And I think that this is a realization across the board. Maybe, maybe I can add something about IGST, as I said. At WASCAL, you know, with partnership, you know, with uh, other organizations like CSIR, but CLAMS, you know, foundation, CLAMS Work Foundation, and we create the IGST hub, West African hub. So you, if you like, you can join the, the hub, and uh, there we are trying to work, you know, and to empower, you know, youth and women, but also marginalize, you know, groups so that they can participate in the decision making, you know, to advance, I mean, such as context specific, you know, adaptation strategy. So you can join the IGST hub as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let me respond briefly to two questions. One is, is on the youth engagement as well. And in Climate Works, we support a range of projects around the world, but two of the ones I'll give examples of that are really youth focused. One is this fantastic um, climate youth, youth climate justice fund that started, which is really supporting youth who are advocating on the ground for climate action in countries in the global south and helping to get funds to them to support the activities they're doing. So it's a wonderful organization. I strongly recommend uh, connecting with them and seeing some of what they're doing. And so that's one area we're supporting. And a second is there is a group that's really starting to mobilize youth voices in the negotiations to help train up uh, those who are engaging in the ne negotiations from a youth perspective and ensure they're able to access those discussions for the reasons others said. I mean, this is, this is important. This is a moment about the future. Um, and it's the youth who are going to be uh, most impacted. So having their voices heard is so important. So those are two areas that we're helping to provide some funding to support. Um, in terms of the question on insurance, um, that, that, fourth, that fourth point I was raising was really about how do we build capacity on adaptation, resilience, as well as loss and damage, and get the financing going. And the insurance sector plays a really critical role. And I think one of the issues that we're seeing is that as we start to see more climate risk disclosures, the insurance system is, has been at the forefront of understanding those and starting to move and adjust in markets because they're the ones who pick up the bill um, if they're engaged. Uh, we're seeing, and I'll give an example from the United States, I live in California, um, in both California and Florida, which, is, which are both subject now to, to many climate impacts, um, flood events, uh, storms, tropical storms, wildfires, um, drought, um, what you've actually seen is a number of insurance companies have said they will no longer insure homeowners in Florida or California, they've pulled out. And that is a market signal, it's a harsh one, but it's a market signal saying, this is not where we should actually be living, really. We need to adjust. So now what we need is mechanisms that can help people to transition to areas that are safer. But certainly the insurance, the insurance system, there's some of those who are best able to understand the climate risks because it's their job. They need to understand those. So bringing them in as partners in this discussion is really essential on adaptation and resilience and finding solutions that work for people. Thanks, Helen. Uh, if, if you guys don't mind, the way I fear we might overshoot the carbon budget, I, I'm also afraid we might overshoot shoot the time budget for the event. So I'd like to, if we could take the questions offline. Uh, yes. Thank Pes. Thanks, I'll May officially close the panel. <laughs> so please take over. Let me thank you, Viti, and the, and, the, and, the, uh, um, and, and the panelists for really sharing, uh, sharing ideas uh, on this topic. Clearly, there are more questions from the audience. I would really encourage that you engage our panelists as the day evolves, because some of the questions are really important to carry forward. 
we have an important announcement uh, to make. So uh, uh, to end, I would like us to have a round of applause for our panelists as they go off the floor. Thank you very much. So we'll have Dr. Hackman, who is a, 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 a scientist at the WASCAL. He has been given an opportunity to, to lead a project called uh, 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 the formation of the IGST West Africa Hub. He's going to make an announcement for us today as he approaches the stage. Um, I like the operationalization document and uh, we want to thank all our stakeholders that were here with us yesterday for a very successful program. So after that, um, after we might have um, achieved the objective of finalizing that document, so the big event today is the launch of the, of the IGST West Africa Corp, which we are doing here today. Uh, we have with us um, our partner from the CSIR in South Africa was here with us. We also appreciate you for coming. Um, of course, with the lead of the team of the IGST in Waska, uh, also with us this morning. It has been a wonderful day, these two days, the validation and then the the launch of the hub. The hub has been open now, so I think uh, the process has been duly completed, and we are still going to take other steps to make sure that uh, this particular hub is what it's supposed to be. So I am encouraging, especially the third sector of development, some are full, that is the civil society. I also talk about the researchers the scientists and then even the first sector of development, which is the government, uh, to be involved in this particular process that we are working on now. That over the past look, one year, we were mandated, you know, to um, establish the West Africa hub of the IGST. And as you could see from the video, this hub is now officially launched and is into full operationalization. Uh, for the sake of time, I wouldn't want to give any more details because our time is almost up. Uh, but I would want to really invite all of you. On Friday, we are going to have a side event that is going to focus mainly on the hub and also its activities now and also the activities that are coming up even after, after the first GST. So you are all welcome to Amphi uh, Caucus Room 2 on Friday from... Uh, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. to learn more about the hub. It's really a wonderful opportunity for all of us, particularly those who are asking, how can the youth, you know, be a part of the process? We will say a lot about it. So we just want to welcome you, and uh, we just want to use this platform as an opportunity to announce the official launch of our hub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to invite, uh, yes, I would like to invite Professor Gunjobi to give the closing remarks. Thanks. So we have to do this on time. Okay, so um, on behalf of uh, WASCAL, um, CSIR, our partner, UNEP, and indeed our giant funder, Climate Works Foundation, we want to express our gratitude to all the speakers today. Please help me to jam your hands together 
for all the speakers that have educated us this morning. Do, can, you can do more better. You can do much more better, much more better. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we want to thank all the speakers once again uh, for the insight that you have given to us on this um, very important topic uh, on global stock take and green growth um, agenda. We are also excited um, on the number of participation that we had here this morning. Despite the fact that um, we, 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 we started our program at side event at 8 a.m., but now you can see that we'll almost have a full house. So please, all participants here, all our national representatives, all our partners, please put your hands together uh, to appreciate uh, your presence here also this morning. Um, we are particularly very, very grateful. Um, Helen, Helen has stepped out. We want to um, specially recognize and thank our funder, the Climate Works, uh, for funding this, um, uh, this project and for making the West African IGST hub a reality. Please help me to appreciate um, Climate Works Foundation by putting up your hands also together to appreciate um, Climate Works. We appreciate you very well. Um, I've been signaled that time is fast spent. Uh, we'll be rounding off again. We are grateful to all this um, extensive discussion that we had this morning. I think um, we have delved into a critical role that global stock take plays in advancing regional green growth um, in our society. Um, as we move forward, let us continue to carry on this insight that um, we have gained here uh, this morning, um, especially in our respective roles and responsibility. Let us work together to harness the potential of global stock take as a powerful tool to accelerate progress towards a more resilient and sustainable world. Um, I would like again, on behalf of all the organizers of this side event, to thank you once again for your active participation and valuable contribution. Let us continue to build upon this momentum that is generated here this morning um, and strive towards a greener, more resilient future for our region and our planet as a whole. Thank you and do have a wonderful day. Just one, one announcement, there will be an opportunity for a family photo outside. So as we uh, go outside and give room to the other uh, event, uh, let's take opportunity of that, thanks.
Thank you.